Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Allison Mounts on borders, islands, and migration. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And every week it's my pleasure to welcome a guest here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario to address some topic of global governance or international public policy. And this week I'm very pleased to welcome Alison Mounts, who's the Canada Research Chair in Global Migration Studies and Associate Professor in the Balsley School of International Affairs as well as Wilfrid Laurier University's Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. And welcome Alison. Thank you. Hello. It's nice to be here. Well, Alison, you're one of the uh, people associated with the International Migration Research Center at Wilfrid Laurier University, which is a, a fast-growing, uh, increasingly dynamic uh, group of scholars who study migration and related issues That's from correct. a variety of perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a geographer, so you yeah. approach migration from a geographer's perspective. And of course, we'll mm -hmm. talk about policies and governance issues as we go along today. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to know, first of all, a little bit more about the research you've been engaged in. and. And secondly, how you approach it as a geographer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll answer both of those. Um, I, I, for the last several years, have been engaged in a project that's all about the role that islands play in global migration. For many years, I've studied global migration, and actually I was studying shifts in border enforcement practices, and I found that increasingly people kept talking about islands uh, over and over again. They kept coming up, and geographers tend to ask locational questions. Why are things located in the places that they are? And so I wondered why do islands keep cropping up every time I tend to do more and more research on border enforcement? Mm. And of course there's a, a very logical geographical answer which is to say that border enforcement has been moving um, more and more offshore, farther outward from the traditional lines that we think of on the map as constituting um, the borders or the boundaries of sovereign territory. So states themselves have been uh, acting more transnationally in their enforcement of migration and in their attempts to, to regulate migration. So the project that I'm working on asks why islands have become important and what role they play in both the transnational practices of states and also the transnational migration journeys that people themselves embark on, sometimes individually but often with the assistance of human smugglers, usually traveling by sea. Um, so there are some really obvious reasons why islands become sites of, of, of struggles over migration, over entry into the nation state. Um, often people get intercepted at sea and then their boat gets towed to an island. <laughs> um, also islands have frequently military histories or colonial histories that might mean they have the infrastructure for detention to happen there. So people end up um, sometimes getting intercepted when they're on their way somewhere and in a detention facility and in a kind of spatial limbo of sorts. So let's say you were trying to get to Australia to make an asylum claim um, or just to enter illicitly to work. Uh, people who are on ships often constitute what policymakers call mixed flows. So some of them will be, will be defined as more economic or economically motivated migrants. Others um, may be fleeing persecution and, and trying to get somewhere to make an asylum claim. So um, let's say someone's intercepted by the Australian Navy and brought to an island. So they might be brought to Christmas Island where Australia has a large detention facility or to even an Indonesian island. Um, and so people enter into a kind of limbo period. They're not quite where they were intending to go. Um, they might be refusing to go home or unable to go home for various reasons and they're sort of stuck in this liminal space somewhere in between their country of origin and what they were planning or ho hoping maybe would be their country of destination. Mm -hmm. And that brings up all sorts of complex issues around jurisdiction and legal status, um, access to rights and so on. So I've been working with a fabulous team of researchers who are graduate students and a postdoctoral fellow, and we've been um, doing research on a number of the islands that specifically emerge as places where both, you could say, states and migrants and advocates and lawyers are all kind of struggling over these issues of migration, rights, asylum, and detention. Now, where do we find these? So we read in the newspapers here in Canada about 
Lampedusa in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. We read about Australia and its immigration policy. Mm -hmm. Is it basically those two parts of the world, or are these issues every uh, in various other places as well? Yeah, no, not exclusively those sites at all, although those are a couple of our key field sites. Um, you find long histories of detention on islands and, and many more places that today are sites where people um, have ended up either very informally um, waiting on, uh, somewhere along the, the transnational journey that they're making or more formally detained by a state. So, um, for example, there are long history of islands being used in migration to the U.S., um, particularly in the Caribbean. Um, you can think of Guantanamo Bay um, before it gained its current notoriety as a site where under Bush there were um, foreign enemy combatants. Uh, there were asylum seekers detained there, particularly from Haiti and from Cuba. So people who were picked up at sea were often brought to the naval base there. Um, also uh, Guam, Saipan, Tinian, um, the Marianas, which are U.S. territories, uh, have been places where um, people have landed en route to try to make an asylum claim or just to work in that region. Um, those are U.S. bits of territory very far away, obviously from sovereign territory, but closer to the regions of origin that people might be coming from. Mm -hmm. so, so there are issues going on there as well. And in fact, Guam is one of our field sites. Yeah. Um, and then all of the, the southern EU you know, islands associated with, with Europe. Um, so the Canary Islands, Malta, Greece, um, and Lampedusa, as you mentioned, which become entry points. So often it's the islands that are somewhere in between the places that people are coming from and the places that they're trying to get to that become these sites of all kinds of you know, negotiations um, between, between states, between individuals, between different groups. So, and it's highly dynamic. Um, often you can think almost symbiotically or certainly relationally about the um, enforcement that goes on, and then the smuggling industry. So, so it's 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 widely believed that any time you harden the border or strengthen border enforcement in one location, smugglers will, will change their routes and migrants too, so they'll go somewhere else. And so we see over the last several years actually a lot of movement of migration routes along those islands that I just mentioned. It used to be that there were thousands of people going to the Canary Islands and then Frontex essentially stepped up enforcement in that region and so the, the migrations move and, and on goes the story. You squeeze the balloon in one place and it bulges in another. Yeah, there are a lot we'll of back analogies. again to talk further about that with Allison Mounts. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So I have the uh, impression, which is probably just wrong, that most <laughs> migrants uh, either cross a land border or fly into airports. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us just what do the numbers show? What proportion of people actually do wind up uh, finding themselves on an island? And, and those people aren't deliberately going to islands, presumably in many cases, are they? They're being taken to islands by states. That's correct. Um, you're correct that it's a statistically small number uh, of people who actually attempt to enter by sea. Um, but what's interesting is that they, they occupy a disproportionately large place in public discourse and in media, and sometimes in policy configurations. So Canada is a good example. The number of people who've come to Canada by boat, both uh, recently, say over the last 10 to 12 years, um, and historically is fairly small if you look um, at the numbers. However, each time that there has been a boat arrival, and I'm thinking specifically of the boats that arrived in 1999 from Fujian, China, off the west coast, and then more recently um, the boats of Tamil Sri Lankans that were intercepted during two consecutive summers, there have been enormous responses, both from the public, you know, unprecedented media coverage, front page stories that are sustained for months, uh, and in both cases, responses by the, the federal government in terms of po changes to policy, specifically around, um, around detention, around uh, front, what are often called front-end security measures pertaining to uh, refugee claims and security checks and so on, as well as um, usually an in increase in fines for uh, smug 
smugglers, so an attempt to, to try to prosecute the smugglers, which is, is not often successful. So, so that, that story plays itself out globally, that although the numbers are relatively small, um, the attention that's paid by many audiences is, is relatively large. Now, statistically, it's really hard to give hard numbers precisely because of two things. One is the informality of what's going on. Um, obviously, smugglers and migrants aren't necessarily trying to announce themselves as they enter mm -hmm. right. <laughs> or wherever they end up, um, either landing or being intercepted. And sometimes states themselves, authorities themselves, are actually trying to, to not uh, necessarily um, publicize what's going on at sea or in detention facilities. Uh, all of the islands where we've been working have histories actually of, of hiding, of trying to hide some of the things that have happened in detention facilities or for a time denying the entry of human rights monitors, for example. So, so it makes islands um, sort of all the more significant. Again, although the, the numbers are small, they are places that receive a lot of attention, both domestically and, and internationally. And if you're processed on an island, mm -hmm. you are usually always treated like a criminal, potential criminal. I mean, there is detention involved, restrictions mm -hmm. on your liberty. Mm -hmm. Are there's there any restrictions on your ability to communicate with the outside world? There's certainly a degree of criminalization that goes on and, and certainly a degree of criminality in the legal process that's going on. However, um, it really varies by site whether or not people have, what kind of access they have to everything from the asylum claims process to legal representation, interpreters, advocacy, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, it really depends on, on the, the island, on the status of the island. So some, some islands, they, ha they have subnational jurisdictions. Some are independent nation states. Some are overseas territories, as in the case of Christmas Island. Uh, Guam is an unincorporated territory of the U.S., so it really varies legally what mm -hmm. kind of access people have. But certainly there's one common story that we could tell, which is that um, people, because of the isolation that they experience in detention on an island, which you, you could almost see as an island within an island, they have more, certainly more mediated access to, right. to any kind of you know, legal procedure or asylum and so on. Um, and, and that story, you know, it takes a different, a different path, but it varies across islands. Um, and certainly, I think that we can see um, the numbers, just to go back to your earlier question, the numbers fluctuate so much, partly because there's this story of the, the very performative and public nature of enforcement, right? So if it's found out that, that, that people are not succeeding at getting in in some place, they might be going somewhere else. And policy often changes. It's very reactive to these, to these kind of high profile uh, human smuggling stories and incidents that happen at sea. So that we could take the example of Italy. It used to be that when um, migrant ships or migrants landed by boat on Lampedusa, they would be, they, they might make an asylum claim in Italy and they would be transferred um, to Sicily. However, uh, around 2005, Italy stopped that practice um, so that people would be held on Lampedusa in detention. Again, you sort of start to see the introduction of distance and the mediation of their access because it used to be that a lot of people um, would eventually sometimes regardless of their, the, the outcome of their asylum claim, make their way out of detention and end up working seasonally you know, as migrant laborers. Again, you go mm -hmm. back to that idea of mixed, uh, mixed flows, some people going to work, some people going to make claims, and all these sort of coming out in a jumble over time. Um, now, in 2009, Italy started to pursue what's called a pushback policy, intercepting people at sea much more aggressively, so never actually allowing them to even reach Lampedusa and entering into all sorts of arrangements to return them more quickly to the places that they're coming from um, or to one of the nearer states that will take them, usually Libya. So we How see can they do that? I mean, how they I mean <laughs> it's not legal, is it, to intercept somebody <laughs> at sea unless they're in your territorial waters? Well, there are a lot of arrangements, and here we go back to the relationship that you often find in the global governance of migration between formal procedures and informal procedures or practices, and uh, formal arrangements and informal arrangements. And there are a lot of bilateral arrangements where people agree to returns, they agree to take people back, or they even agree to detain people. So mm -hmm. for example, between Australia and Indonesia, there's a relationship. Australia has been funding the construction of detention facilities 
around Indonesia, which again introduces a real limbo around legality. So if you're if you're let's say you're from Afghanistan, you're making your way to Australia, and you end up in detention in Indonesia, where are you? You know, yes, you're in Indonesia. Indonesia is not a signatory to the convention relating to the status of refugees. You wanted to get to Australia. You're not quite an asylum seeker. You're almost a potential asylum seeker. You haven't even reached the territory that enables you to, to become legally an asylum seeker. And so you're in this utter legal, legal limbo in Indonesia. Um, and we see that repeat itself. So, so yes, there have been accusations around um, illegality of what's happening, both with the boarding of ships uh, at international on international seas, and also uh, the return of people, which uh, has been argued is in, in violation of the principle of non-refoulement, where people will not be returned to a place where they're in danger. Um, and, and you also have a lot of what are called third party or third country um, practices where someone steps in. So for example, many of the people who are being returned to Libya are not actually from Libya. Um, but Libya is willing to enter into these arrangements with Italy. And there are often very informal, almost what have been called development strategies going on, where um, Italy is investing a lot in the infrastructure that enables some of these things to happen in Libya, which of course right. uh, fell apart recently. Yes. <laughs> Hence, you see the numbers. In 2010, after the pushback policy, the numbers had really dropped on Lampedusa. There were almost no people in detention for a time in the summer of 2010 when we were there doing some field work. There were boats that were landing from time to time. They would get through that sort of net at sea, but they would be quickly transferred elsewhere. Things were very quiet on Lampedusa. Then the Arab Spring happened, and the numbers exploded. And I've seen estimates ranging from 26,000 to 48,000 people landing on Lampedusa just um, in 2011. And demonstrations by the inhabitants of Lampedusa. That's right. Okay. Very. These are very contested very arrivals, contested. very contested situations. Right. Um, well, we'll be back to talk further about islands, borders, and migration with Allison Mounts. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So for our remaining time, what I'd like to do is talk a bit about national policies and global governance and the interplay between those two. But let's start with the national policies. So are there countries that are particularly well behaved with regard to handling migrants in island contexts and countries that are particularly badly behaved mm -hmm. in regard to handling them? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I would say in the context, I was thinking beyond the context of islands because of course there's a very recursive relationship between what's happening on the island and what's happening right. on mainland territory and I was about to praise Canada <laughs> um, because Canada historically has been seen as a leader in issues of refugee resettlement and having you know many protections built in over time into the refugee claimant process. However, recently that's been changing um, in part due to some of the very high profile arrivals that I mentioned earlier by boat in 1999 and again in the last few years. Um, there, there have been all sorts of, we have Bill C-4 and all sorts of proposals around the slippery slope to mandatory detention and uh, things, things are definitely changing here too. Um, however, the reason why I then hesitated is that it, although Canada has many islands, it's not really as defined a set of islands. Mm -hmm. Canada doesn't have anything like um, the, the kind of very explicit decisions that a country like Australia has made to use islands. So um, not having an island detention facility is an indication that your immigration policy is probably <laughs> better than average. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> uh, or at the very least that um, you haven't. I mean, you know, Hannah Arendt, Giorgio Agamben, scholars like these have made arguments over the years that um, if you look at the, the treatment of non-citizens, you learn a lot about sovereign power, yeah. right? right. Um, about the issue of human rights and the role that states play uh, in, in, on the global stage. And certainly, um, you know, you asked me for some of the bad practices. <laughs> I'd say Australia especially has a pretty checkered history, um, as does the U.S. In the Australian case, it's fascinating to think of uh, you know, in recent years, um, what's very well known is what was called Australia's Pacific Solution, which again began with this very high profile incident um, where a ship called the MV Tampa uh, attempted to rescue a ship carrying um, 
I think, close to 400 people who were in distress. The ship was in distress. And um, then Prime Minister John Howard basically sort of threw down the gauntlet and said that ship will not land on Australian territory. You know, enough is enough. And so um, a standoff ensued between the Australian Navy and the captain of the ship. Um, and, and, you know, the law of the sea would suggest that you're allowed to go to the, the closest port when you are, are, are operating, are doing a rescue, which is the right. law that you right. rescue a, a ship in distress. But eventually what happened was one of these third parties you know, practices that I mentioned where other countries basically stepped in and offered to, to house people. So they were brought to the small island state of Nauru, um, they were brought to Christmas Island, which is Australian territory, and, and eventually other islands got drawn into what came to be known as Australia's Pacific Solution. Um, Australia practiced what's called uh, the power of excision, so the parliament met and retroactively excised many bits of its own territory from Australia for the purposes of migration. So for the purposes of migration law, if you were on Christmas Island, for example, you were not technically in Australia because of this excision. Um, so all kinds of creative things, relationships between geography and the law emerge. So that was called the Pacific Solution, and more, more recently people have called the, the offshoring even farther away in Indonesia the Indonesian Solution. Right. <laughs> so we see, again, the um, sort of informal exchanges where Australia is funding some of these enforcement practices and infrastructure in Indonesia. And what's um, driving that? Is this just xenophobia? Is that what it boils down to? It's hard to say exactly what drives these decisions, but certainly um, there's a political will for them. That is something that you find. You know, it's it's not the, as I said the the responses to very high profile kind of tragic human stories of of ships at sea, ships being lost at sea, um, horrible things happening. These these have a life. Uh, they can stay on the front of the newspaper for a long time, be the lead story mm -hmm. in the news. And so I think politicians are often motivated to capitalize on those. And, and actually, that, that's an argument that I make um, in, in the book that I published last year called Seeking Asylum, where often these, these moments that play out as crises become moments when enforcement agendas are moved forward, um, which, which have political you know, capital, which have the often tacit support of the public. Um, and so often it's, it's the, the political agenda that's driving mm -hmm. things, not necessarily respect for the law or respect for the refugee convention, protecting people's rights, um, or even sort of a more you know, calm and rational look at the numbers of people who are arriving, which as you said, when we started speaking, tended to tend to be fairly small. Mm -hmm. um, so there's also an argument about the, the industry of detention. Um, detention can be big business, and I'd say that's a place where the United States has to be shamed as a really terrible example. Uh, we currently have about 350 facilities in the U.S. where people are, are in detention. I mean, an array of different kinds of facilities. Some of them are dedicated federal detention facilities. Many, many of them are local county jails where the federal government pays, essentially pays for beds to house um, its federal detainees. So, uh, you know, if you start to look around arguments about the privatization of detention and the prison industry, um, and, and sometimes even the idea that in some of these places, so some of the islands where we work, detention becomes a really big employer. So, for example, on Christmas Island, the local population is around 1,100 or so. The population in detention when we were there last summer in 2011 was around 2,600. Um, and Australia built an enormous high security facility there. So we heard stories of people on Christmas Island who, Christmas Islanders, who hadn't worked during their lifetime necessarily, but had gone to work at the detention facility. They couldn't, they couldn't staff the detention facility. And when we were there, uh, other, other places, so for example, the local grocery store had shut down because they couldn't staff the grocery store. So people were being flown in. More flights had been added on. There are these very interesting stories to tell that are almost old geographical stories about resource industries and, and what happens when you put a, a big employer in it in a small place. So, Fascinating. Yeah. It's almost the opposite of the not in my backyard syndrome. Almost. We'll be back again with Allison Mounts. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.
Welcome back. So to what extent is this issue governed globally? Is this a, a national policy world that we're in with respect to these migrants, or is there in fact some kind of global or even regional governance uh, mm -hmm. regime mm -hmm. that's supposed to regulate and discipline, mm -hmm. provide norms for the handling of these situations? Mm -hmm. I'd say that it has traditionally been quite quite a national uh, issue, immigration generally, but that we're seeing recent moves towards more concerted efforts at both regional solutions, which is a phrase that comes up a lot in, in, in immigration circles, and um, global governance of migration, which also com is coming up more and more as a, as a trend um, and as a, a real effort. Um, by various both states and different um, parties to to try to bring different states that are interested in this to the table. Um, the problem is that, well, the problems are many. <laughs> the challenge with migration is that there are very many different reasons why people migrate. Some are economic migrants. Um, people move for all kinds of reasons, everything from studying to tourism. Um, and so very different kinds of um, tools will govern, will be used in the governance of migration, which encompasses all sorts of things from passport documents, visas, to um, you know, the more kind of security-minded issues uh, where you have national security efforts. And so I'd say we're seeing this kind of piecemeal set of arrangements, a lot of bilateral agreements between states around return to countries of origin, for example, start to crystallize into more regional and global conversations. Um, certainly there are UN conventions, particularly relating to the status of refugees, um, that dictate some of what's happening. Uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees is very involved, of course, with, with, with that population or with those populations. However, um, there are much larger populations on the move and particularly you know, in, the, in the kind of migrations that, that we've been that we've been studying that, that sort of draw the attention of border enforcement, for example. And so what we're seeing, for example, in the EU is a lot of regional effort at member states collaborating, collaborating through Frontex as the coordinating agency and border enforcement. Um, we see- Is that know, supranational governance or is that individual European countries doing their own thing with respect to migration policy but coordinating with each other? Yeah, um, I'd say I'd say both. I'd say there's a real attempt at supranational governance, clearly, you know, through the EU. Um, and that in some of these areas of migration, those attempts have been more successful than in others. So people have been much more sort of amenable to working together at um, creating norms and, and laws around labor migration, for example, within the EU, easing border crossings for the purposes of work. But they've been much slower to create uh, norms and laws around a common asylum policy. And again, here you get into the thorny issues that we we're talking about, the, the domestic politics versus you know, the sort of desire or willingness to, certainly not a desire, but a willingness to give up some of one's sovereign power to be part of a supranational mm -hmm. body. Um, you know, you see that in, in a place like Malta, where Malta used to be a, a transit country. People would pass through. La Malta's very close to, to Sicily. Um, it's another of those entry points, or that's become what's often called a hot spot, uh, where people would pass through trying to get into the EU. So Malta didn't actually have to worry too much itself about migration. It has a very long history of, of migration. But since joining the EU, um, there are different standards that Malta has to uphold. And so you've seen very recently detention increase there and a lot of attention paid by the European Union to what's happening on those peripheral, in those peripheral locations of islands, mm. including What's Malta. the role of non-state actors in these governance arrangements? Mm -hmm. Who are they and what do they try to do? Yeah, I'd say the role is very important, often because of the kind of limbo that people end up in, and certainly just because of the way that asylum works. Um, people often will, will, have, will seek assistance if it's available. I mean, it's less available. That's the issue of geography on some of these remote islands. 
but often there are advocacy communities, there are interpreters, sometimes this is referred to as the refugee industry, um, and certainly when we were on Christmas Island, we saw this refugee industry flourishing. Um, interpreters were being flown in, and um, certainly you see activists um, calling attention to what's happening in places where human rights violations are happening, where people aren't getting access to asylum where, where they should mm -hmm. have access. So. Um, so those are some of the those are some of the third parties. You could also think, uh, sorry, uh, non-state actors. You could also think of the industries, the, the the corporations involved. You know, everyone who, from the people who build and run um, detention facilities, to those who service them, people who might fly, you know, flights into Christmas Island. Um, there are a lot of kind of secondary in industries associated mm. with what's what's going on. Uh, so I'd say industry, advocacy, um, and also international organizations such as the International Organization for Migration, uh, which plays a role both in terms of the movement of individuals or groups of migrants, but also in providing a forum for some of the states in, involved to come to the table to make arrangements. An enormous range of players and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Well, a complex issue, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, congratulations on the work you've done and uh, you. all the best as it continues moving thank forward. You. To our audience, thank you for joining us today and join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.